Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, those of you who are visiting, as Pastor said, I am Justin. I'm the associate here. So this morning, if you like this message, then come back next week so you can hear an even better one from our senior pastor. And if today's message is awful, come back next week so you can hear a good one. Amen. No, I'm kidding. It doesn't matter who's up here preaching. What matters is that we preach the Word of God in this church, and the Word of God is where the power is. Amen? Amen. Well, we are in the middle of the Christmas season now. You can see uh, the church has been decorated. My wife, Christy, and Miss Nikki did a great job of decorating. We have the tree up. I am rocking this awesome Christmas sweater uh, to celebrate the occasion, and so today... We're going to start a three-part series about the Christmas story, not a Christmas story, as wonderful as that movie is. Um, we are going to talk about the Christmas story, the real Christmas story, in three parts, past, present, and future. And so, naturally, today, we will start with Christmas past. Now, what do we think of when we hear that term, Christmas past? We think of wise men, we think of Jesus in the manger, we think of, of Jesus being born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph, but listen, that's not what we're going to talk about today, okay? I do not want to take it for granted that everyone in this room knows that that is not where Jesus got his start. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that was not the beginning of Jesus, now we believe that that life begins at conception, but Jesus did not even have his start at his conception. Amen? Jesus is from eternity past, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. That is what we mean when we say Christmas past, Christ in eternity past. Now, before we get into the text, I just want to issue a warning. Some of you in here have been in church 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, maybe even longer, and you might think to yourself, I already knew that. I already know this. I have heard this every Christmas my entire life. But listen, the Word of God, we cannot plumb the depths of it. It is the very Word of God. And so what we're going to do before we even get into the text, we're going to pray for you, for everyone that's here, maybe somebody's never heard this story before, but even for the one who's heard this a hundred times, God can still speak to you through it. And even if I don't tell you anything that you don't know already, we must always be in wonder and in awe about who Jesus really is. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're going to do this morning. John chapter 17 is where we are going to be. John chapter 17 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, I am so thankful that you have given us your word. You have given us the word of life, God, and that we can know you. We can know some of your attributes. We can know your son, Jesus Christ, through the word, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, through the word of God. And Lord, I just pray, Father, that this morning that we would be attentive, God, that we would not dismiss this, Father, not because I'm preaching, God, but because your word is being preached, Lord. And God, we know that your word never returns void. And so I just pray this morning that all of us, myself included, would be open to hear what you would reveal to us through your word, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And we look forward to seeing you work this Christmas season. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So John chapter 17 is where we are going to be. Just to kind of set this up, this is not really a, a, a normal Christmas passage. What's happening here is Jesus has already been born. He's lived 33 years. And he and his disciples have just had the Last Supper together. Judas has already taken his leave to go betray Jesus, and Jesus is looking forward to the cross, and then even beyond that. Now, the reason I want to look at this 
In the midst of all this, Christ says a great prayer. He prays first for himself, second for his disciples, and then third, he prays for all future believers. And the reason that I want to start this, this series here is because we need to understand who Jesus really is. Before we get to the manger, before we get to his death, burial, and resurrection, we have got to understand who Jesus truly is. Because if we don't understand who Jesus is, then Christmas does not mean anything. Christmas is just another excuse to take off work. It's just another excuse to exchange presents or get drunk at your office Christmas party. Right? Nobody said amen. Good. (laughs) But we have to understand who Christ truly is. And this prayer that Jesus prays to the Father about himself reveals a great deal about him. So let's take a look. John 17 Starting in verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Verse 5, and this is where we're going to focus on. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Number one, Jesus is God. Now, again, I don't want to assume that everyone knows this, and even if you all know this, we need to be in wonder of it, and this prayer reveals this to us. First of all, Jesus identified himself as God, and we can see that in verse 5. Jesus prays. He's praying to his Father, and in this prayer, he identifies who he is. O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, It's interesting because, of course, most of the world does not believe that Jesus is God, right? They deny his deity, and there's people that will even tell you that Christ never claimed to be God, or he never identified himself as God. I actually, just this week, I read uh, read an interview with this uh, man who just put out a book that's all about this subject, how Jesus never claimed to be God, and this is a quote from him. And keep in mind... This man who wrote this is a religious studies professor at a university in the United States. He has a Ph.D. from Princeton University, and he has a Master's of Divinity from a seminary here in the United States. So this guy has top-level education, right? This is what he says on the matter. Quote, During his lifetime, Jesus himself didn't call himself God, didn't consider himself God, And none of his disciples had any inkling at all that he was God. So is that true? Did Jesus claim to be God or identify himself as God? I don't really like saying that he claimed to be God because whenever you say it, it kind of casts doubt about it. He identified himself as God in this prayer. First of all, as he's praying to the Father, he says, glorify me with God. The, together with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the world was. Isaiah 42 clearly tells us that God will not share his glory with anyone. Okay? God alone will take the glory. So Christ asking his heavenly Father, give me some of that glory, share that glory with me, restore me to that glory. He is clearly identifying himself as God. God does not share his glory. Christ asking his father to restore him to his former glory that he had with him before the world was is him clearly, through prayer, identifying himself as God. He may not have come out and said, I am God at this point, but he clearly identifies himself as God. And this is not the only time that he identifies himself as such. And actually, I wanted to make a note real quick. This quote from this this PhD professor 
shows us something. This doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about this morning, but I can't help but comment on it. When it comes to the word of God, who, illum who illuminates the truth of the word of God to us? The Holy Spirit. Who possesses the Holy Spirit? Believers. Listen. Listen to me. This is important. You cannot trust the interpretation of Scripture to someone who is not a believer, point blank, because they do not have the Holy Spirit. Now, that does not mean that they are 100% wrong all the time, but that is how you get ideas like this, that Christ never claimed to be God. It's because somebody does not have the illumination of the Holy Spirit, they are not a believer. And this gentleman that made this quote is not a believer. So that's just kind of a side note. Interpretation of Scripture is by believers alone. So anyway, Jesus clearly identifies himself as God in this prayer. But he, this is not the only place that he does. Take a look at Mark 14. This is Jesus at his trial before the Sanhedrin. This uh, episode is going to follow what we're reading about here shortly. He's going to be on trial before the Sanhedrin. And what's going on? is they're having all these witnesses come in. They're trying to testify against Christ. Nobody's story's matching up. And so they're making all these accusations against him. And Jesus, it says, but he, Jesus, kept silent and answered nothing. And again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, he just asked him point blank, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? That is, are you the Son of God? It's saying that you are the Son of God was saying that you are equal to God. It was saying that you are in fact God. Verse 62, Jesus answers them and he says, I am clearly identifying himself as God. And he actually elaborates a little bit further. He says, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is a reference to Daniel chapter seven. It is a prophecy that was made by Daniel about God coming in clouds of glory and in power. And Jesus says, I will be sitting right next to him, right at his right hand. He is clearly identifying himself as God. Furthermore, Matthew 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says to them, who do people say that I am? His disciples say, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're one of the other prophets that's come back from the dead. And so Jesus says, okay, well, what, who do you say that I am? Peter's response, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, what does Jesus do? Does he rebuke him and say, no, no, Peter, I'm just a good teacher. Or no, Peter, I'm just a good man. No, Jesus answers and says to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Not only does Jesus not correct him, but he says, Blessed are you for this proclamation, and it was my Father in heaven who revealed that to you. Listen, these, these are not the only instances of this happening. Jesus clearly identified himself as God. Furthermore, Jesus proved he was God. Anybody can claim to be God. We have seen that happen in cults throughout history, people claiming to be God. Jesus Christ was the only man who ever lived who proved that he was, in fact, who he said he was. This prayer that he prayed, he could not have prayed these things if he was not God. So he proves that he is. Take a look at Matthew 11. Uh, John the Baptist has been put in prison. And it says that John heard in prison about the works of Christ. John had been preaching Christ. He had been preaching the coming Messiah. And he heard about everything that Jesus was doing. And so he sent two of his disciples and they said to him, Are you the coming one? That is the Messiah. That is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Are you him? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. 
the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And then he goes on further to say, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Listen, Jesus answers them. They say, are you him? Are you the son of God? Are you the Christ? And he says, go tell John this. Here's what I've been doing. And he's saying to them, who else could do this? Who else could make the blind see and the lame walk? Who else could cleanse lepers and bring people back from the dead? What's the answer? God alone. Only God can do this. John 20. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. Not everything Jesus did can even be recorded. is not even recorded in the scripture. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Listen, Jesus performed these miracles. He did these things, these signs and wonders, so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He did it to prove he was who he said he was. And one more, Acts chapter, 20, uh, Acts chapter 2, excuse me. This is Peter preaching at Pentecost. Um, he's preaching this great, this great sermon, and he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by what? Miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. God attested to the fact that Jesus was, in fact, God by his miraculous power. The things he did proved that he was God. And this is to say nothing of his virgin birth, of his raising from the dead after he was killed. Listen, Jesus proves that he is God. He didn't just claim to be God. He proved that he was God. And as God... Jesus is from eternity past. Like we said at the beginning, Jesus did not begin at the manger. Jesus is from eternity past. Back to our text, John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had when with you before the world was. He is saying God, my Father, please restore me to that glory I had with you in all of eternity past, before the world began, before time existed. Look at, look at this from John 8. This is one of the boldest times that Christ identifies himself as God. He's arguing with the Pharisees. They're asking him about his dad, who's your father. And then they, they kind of get swelled up and they say, well, Abraham's our father. They're getting real proud of themselves and kind of name dropping Abraham. And so Jesus says to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He says, you've got Abraham as your father. Well, I'll do you one better. Before Abraham was, I am. Now that phrase, I am, is very significant, okay? It ties us back to the Old Testament. We'll look at that in a second. But listen, I am was the name that God gave himself when he identified who he was to Moses at the burning bush. And the term I am, it connotates this idea, I am God that is pre-existent, that is before time, that is from eternity past. Look at Exodus chapter 3. Moses sees the burning bush. He takes off his shoes because he's on holy ground. Why is it holy ground? Because he is in the presence of God. God tells him he's going to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And then Moses says to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and they say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Moses is asking God, who, who am I going to tell them sent me? Mos and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus, you shall say to the children of Israel, 
I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. God gives himself the name I am forever. Now, in John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am. He is using that name that God gives himself. I am the God of eternity past. He and I are one. Jesus identified himself as God. Jesus proved he was God And Jesus is from eternity past. So, obviously, there are many implications for us in this. But I want to focus on one thing specifically. As as Jesus is God of eternity past, number two in your notes, Jesus had glory. Glorify me together with yourself with the glory of which I had with you before the world was. Listen, Christ, before he came to earth, was in heaven with his Father in in glory. And we're going to look at what that exactly means. What? Okay, he was in glory. What does that mean? What does that glory look like? The glory of God in heaven, which Christ is saying here, that he had with his father before the world began. Now, this is, we can only know so much about this glory, okay? But the Old Testament specifically reveals some of it to us. Let's take a look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1. God allows Ezekiel to have a glimpse of the, th- the throne room of heaven. So Ezekiel describes The angels that are there, the four living creatures is what he calls them. He says, above them is a firmament that is like pure crystal. And he says, above the firmament, this is where we pick it up in verse 26 of Ezekiel 1. Above the firmament, over the heads, that is over the heads of the living creatures, the likeness of a throne. In appearance like a sapphire stone. It's beautiful. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. Fire, it's bright, it's glorious, it's it's blinding. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around it like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. So was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Ezekiel is trying to describe as best he can what he is seeing. He uses imagery like fire and a rainbow, sapphire and amber. It's it's this intense bright, beautiful picture of God's glory. That is the glory of God in the throne room of heaven. Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. This is Isaiah having a prophecy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. His glory represented by the train of his robe, fills the entire temple. Above it stood seraphim, that is, angels that are in his throne room, serving him and worshiping him. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. Why? Because the glory of God is so great. With two he covered his feet. Why? Same reason that Moses had to take his shoes off at the burning bush, because they're in a holy place. They're in the presence of God in all his glory. And with two he flew, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In heaven, God is in glory in his throne room. 
being praised and worshipped by angels day and night. That is the glory that Christ is referring to, that he enjoyed in eternity past. Look at Nehemiah uh, 9.6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, with all the angels, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven, that means all the angels of heaven, worships you. We can only have a glimpse of this glory, but we learn about it in Scripture, okay? Christ enjoyed glory in heaven, angels praising him, this beautiful, intense glory. It is a glory that is so overwhelming that the priests were unable to minister when his glory descended upon the temple. We learn that in 2 Chronicles. It's a glory so great that the heavens themselves declare it. The sky declares the glory of God just in his existence. Excuse me, just in its existence. It is a glory so powerful that Exodus 33 tells us that no man can look upon it and live. That is how powerful God's glory is. It is a glory so vast that it fills the entire earth. Isaiah 6 told us that, and then it is repeated in Numbers 14. Now listen. This is just a little sample of the glory that Christ experienced before he came to earth. Now, he will be restored to glory. He is restored to glory in heaven. Okay? But listen, this has a special meaning for us. Okay? Keep this in mind. When you're thinking about the glory of heaven, number three, Jesus left heaven's glory for you. Christ in eternity past was in heaven being praised by angels. His glory is described as filling the temple. This is the glory of the Lord as described in the Old Testament. It is this intense, beautiful, overwhelming glory that Christ enjoyed. He gave that up to come to earth. And listen to this. This is another thing that struck me as I was studying this. If Christ had left that and come to earth, being the richest man who ever lived, having servants, having everything that this world has to offer, if he would have done that, that would have been a tremendous sacrifice for him. Amen? If that is the way that Christ would have come to earth in royalty, in riches, That would have been a sacrifice. That would have been a huge sacrifice for him. That's not what he did. He went from the highest of the high, God glorified in heaven. He is still God. Okay, he never never is not God. Don't misunderstand me. But listen, he left that to humble himself and come to earth to be in poverty and in squalor, to be humiliated and rejected by people. So he went from top of the top, to the dregs of society, if you will. Take a look at Philippians chapter 2. Who, this is talking about Christ, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery. That means he did not consider it something to be grasped. To be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation. Did he have a reputation in heaven? Yes, he was God. He was the Lord. He is the Lord. Taking the form of a bondservant, did he serve anyone in heaven? He was served by angels and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Listen, Christ sacrificed so much to be able to come 
to this earth for you. Next week, we're going to talk about that manger. We're going to talk about that night in Bethlehem, that first Christmas. But before we get there, I want us to realize or to perhaps remember that Christ had so much that he sacrificed for you in order for that to happen. So what does that mean for us? Well, for the believer, what can you give him? We, we, we're studying what Christ put aside in order to take on the form of a man and come to earth. Right? He sacrificed a great deal. So what are you holding on to that you've been unwilling to give up for him, believer? I'm talking to believers. That is, those of you who have put your faith and trust in Christ, you have recognized that you are a sinner, repented of and turned from your sin to follow Jesus Christ and trust in him. What are you holding on to? What have you been refusing to sacrifice for your Lord? Is it time or attention? Well, God, I'll, I'll, I'll be in prayer and I'll study my Bible here and there when I can, when it's convenient for me. Was it convenient for Christ to be humbled to the death on the cross? No. There was a time that was set aside in history for that to happen. Have you been willing to set aside time for him and say, you know what, no matter what comes, I'm going to carve out this time and I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord. And whatever else comes, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to build my schedule around that. Or have you been fitting him in where it's convenient for you? Maybe it's pride. Ooh, that's a big one, right? We're proud to be an American. We're a proud society. Well, are we proud as believers? Well, God, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to obey you, except in this one area. Because I'm pretty sure I know what I'm doing in this area or that area. Are you clinging to pride? Be willing to sacrifice that for him. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's material. Maybe it's a relationship. I don't know. Whatever. There is, there is a section in the bottom of your notes that is for you and for you alone. I want you to think this week. Dwell on it. Meditate on it. Scripture tells us to meditate. Meditate on all of these things that Christ sacrificed for you. And let the Holy Spirit reveal to you, believer, perhaps some area that you have been unwilling to sacrifice for him. What about for the unbeliever? This is the person who has rejected Christ or maybe didn't know who he really was, maybe he's unsure about whether or not they're saved. What can you give him, unbeliever? The question is the same, but the answer is very, very different. You have nothing to offer Jesus Christ, God, very God, God in the flesh. You have nothing to offer him until you offer him your very life. And that looks like recognizing that you are a sinner. You have done things, said things, thought things that displease God, that do not line up with his holy law. You are a sinner. Confessing your sin, repenting of it, that means turning away from it, trusting in Christ, calling upon him as Lord and Savior, and following him. All right, being saved is not just praying a prayer and then having a get, a get out of hell free card and turning and walking and not changing anything about your life. It is becoming a disciple of Christ. We have been told that in America for far too long. Yes, a prayer is part of it, but that is not the only part. But listen, if you know for sure that you are not a believer or you don't know for sure that you are a believer, does that make sense? 
If you do not know for sure what is going to happen to you when you die, if you are going to get to enjoy this glory that we've been talking about, sharing it with your Lord, if you don't know for sure that describes you, what can you give him? It is your life. It is your obedience through trusting in him as Savior. And listen, if that describes you, please, The moment of salvation is now. If you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin and you know you're not saved, please do not delay. Come and talk to me. Come and talk to Pastor Dave. Uh, If you're you're more comfortable with it, talk to to Miss Nikki or my wife, Christy. Get that settled today. The time of salvation is now. I want us all to... Go to the Lord in prayer together. Listen, believer, think this week about what it is that you can sacrifice for him. Is there something you're holding on to? You who are not a believer, you don't know if you're a believer, come and talk to us. Come and talk to someone. Or if it's not one of us, somebody that you know is a faithful disciple of Christ, and get that settled. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for speaking through your word. God, I am not worthy to preach. None of us are, God, but the power of your Holy Spirit is what works through us to reveal the truth of your word, God. And I just pray, Father, For the believers in this room, God, that have been clinging to things, God, I know that I've been convicted as I've studied and gotten ready for this message. I have been convicted of the things that I've been willing to refuse or that I've been willing to sacrifice for you, God. And after studying and and learning just a little glimpse of what you sacrificed for me, Lord, I'm ashamed of those things, God. And I'm so thankful that you are merciful to me. And God, I just pray that prayer for every one of us here that's a believer, God, that you would reveal to us the sin in our lives, Father, the sin of of whatever it is, the sin of holding on to something that we've refused to give to you, Lord. Forgive us, convict us of that, reveal it to us so that we can dispense with it, God, and we can serve you more faithfully, God. And I want to pray for those in this room that are not believers. God, we are... We are in the Christmas season. We're focusing on your son, Jesus Christ, and his birth. But God, I just want to pray for those right now, Father, that don't know him as their Savior, Lord, that you would convict and you would turn hearts, Father, that you would regenerate hearts to be saved. God, we love you. I thank you so much for this congregation. I thank you for for just uh, giving me this opportunity. And and God, I just pray, Father, for everything we do for the rest of today, through what remains of worship and, and all day, God, that you would just be with us, be here with us, and just work through us. And it's in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.